supported shoulder stand. Okay, so those are the only four postures that are listed by, that with a description in the oldest yoga literature known to exist currently. There may be other literature. There's certainly been literature less old than that that listed more. And in the 50s, we have Iyengar publishing Light on Yoga and his 100 Postures, uh, which was published for foreign tourists, by the way, uh, according to Iyengar. Okay? Because they needed books, because they didn't grow up doing the lifestyle of yoga. See, when I went to school, when I first went to school in yoga, we were not allowed to take notes. We were not allowed to take pictures. We were not allowed, not allowed, not allowed. We were not allowed to make drawings. We were not allowed. Why? Because at that time, even in the 70s, Yoga teachers in India and in uh, Thailand and Burma and so on, Philippines and Indonesia and Malaysia believe that if you took a picture of a thing, you stole something from it. So if you took a picture, if I took a picture of you doing a yoga posture, you were less you the minute after I took the picture than when I took it. Because the picture itself was taking something of your soul, of your spirit, of your essence away from you. And in fact, in Thailand, it could get you killed in the country. If you went in, in the, right through the 80s, if you went outside of a major city, and if you were in the country, if you went to Noiseland, where her people are from, and you just started taking pictures of people, if somebody came up with a knife and stabbed you and took that camera away from you and threw it down on the ground and smashed it, they would take your body to jail. Because that would not be a crime. Why? Well, you were stealing. No, I was just taking pictures. Right. You were stealing my life force. You were stealing my essence. Now they don't do that so much anymore. Now it's just Timbot. <laughs> Timbot. You want to take a picture, you got to pay. Everybody pays. Timbot. 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 Ha. You want to be a model? Sibot. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Sibot. Sibot. Ten bots, right? Now you pay. But that's the softening effect, okay? And the, right through the 80s, if you did that, you could be stabbed. You could be killed. People were stabbed. People were killed. Cameras were destroyed, snatched off your body. I physically watched at, at, literally at the most touristed temple in Thailand, which is the Grand Palace, where the Emerald Buddha is. I personally watched a tourist person who was next to me, about two people over, who pulled a camera out of a fanny pack and was taking pictures of the Emerald Buddha from here with their camera, out, which they took out of the fanny pack. And I personally watched a guard come in from outside the building. So obviously they had cameras inside, video inside, because he, he came from outside. And he walked, sorted through the people, which is elbow deep people. There's always 500 people in the chapel, right? So it's a traffic jam. He sorted his way. I was all the way up front. He came all the way up front, and I sensed a disturbance in the field, and I turned around just in time to walk up behind this woman, walked up behind her, grabbed her by both ears, and jerked her to her feet. When she got to her feet, he spun her around, grabbed her camera, and snatched it away from her, and then grabbed her by one ear and dragged her out of the chapel. When he got to the door, he walked one step outside the door, took her camera and smashed it on the ground, and then he put his finger in her and told her to get out and never come back. Now. And she was like, ba ba ba, and he pushed her. Didn't knock her down. It was kind of violent, see. In the Buddhist temple, the most famous Buddhist temple in Thailand. All right, if she had done that 10 years earlier, she might not have lived to get off the temple grounds. In the 1960s, the American government had to issue a bulletin to American servicemen about these kinds of things because about 20 American servicemen had been murdered in Thailand for doing things like taking pictures. 
So it w and my school was that strict. And in fact, I was never allowed to take pictures while I was there. Okay? There are pictures now, and I did sneak a couple of pictures. Why? Because I'm bad and I'm American. So I do have a couple of pictures, right? But there are my stuff. I took pictures of my stuff, right? Um, and all the pictures I do have, I have permission. But uh, that's another story. So there were no books. I wrote the first book ever published on Thai massage in English. I wrote it. I published it. 1982, Meta Journal Press, Nua Thai, Traditional Thai Medical Massage. I wrote, the, I wrote and published the first book ever published in the United States and English on Thai massage, okay? It was made from notes that I made after I left Thailand because I was not allowed to make notes while I was in Thailand. Not in the school, and I lived in the school. I had two cameras that were taken away from me and destroyed. Same in India. When I went to India, we were not allowed to take notes in class, in yoga class. Why? Yoga is a sacred practice. Sacred practice. Do you always take notes when you're praying? Do you know that every asana is a prayer? Every single one? Classically speaking, traditionally speaking, if you're a sadhu, there's no argument here. You're not going to win an argument with a sadhu that every yoga posture is not a prayer. But you're saying, well, wait a minute, but you're moving. You're using your body. And they're like, and? Where did you ever get the idea that movement is not a form of prayer? Movement is prayer. Breath is prayer. Thinking is prayer. Singing is prayer. Chanting is prayer. In fact, uh, we were told by our elders that we're supposed to cultivate an attitude of unceasing prayer. In other words, we're supposed to be praying all the time. So if I'm supposed to be praying all the time, am I not supposed to be praying when I'm doing my yoga? Of course. Of course I am. In the system, the way this was built in is we were told puja is the most important part. Puja is mostly Tr most correctly translated as, as uh, prayer. And what Pakru Samai and the other teachers like uh, Ajahn uh, Aj Tawi and Ajahn Anantasuk and Ajahn Bunsorn and Ajahn Bila Asidi Sopang and so on and so forth taught me was that if you took the 10,000 techniques of Thai and you eliminated all of them except for one, the only one that would be important that you could do and still get the results and not do any of the others was this, was puja. So a Thai session is puja, stuff in the middle, puja. The traditional model of medical application is puja, stuff in the middle, puja, and everybody does puja. Everybody does puja. Every doctor does puja. Every therapist does puja. Every practitioner does puja. Every teacher does puja. No exaggeration. Everybody does puja. And if you get into it with people and you say, well, you know, in the West, we don't have anything that's lasted a thousand years. Nothing. We have nothing that's lasted a thousand years. The only thing in Western culture that's lasted a thousand years is religion. Really, it's the only thing, which is based on what? Prayer. So from a philosophical construct, the oldest philosophical construct still functioning in a Western society today is the practice of prayer. Nothing else is equal. I will say astrology is also almost as old, maybe, maybe as old. Astrology, you know, that is the oldest science, not, not immunology, astrology. Okay, and yes, I argue. I can argue with you if you want to argue if astrology is a real science or not. It's way more real science than psychiatry. Don't get me started. <laughs> All right. So puja. So the old man, 36th generation grandmaster of our ancient school, told me that that you could 
I said, I, I would watch the, let, let, I gotta put the conversation in context. I would watch the old people practice, old yogis. You wanna know what yoga is really about? Don't watch the 20 something sleeping about. 20 something sleep about even if they don't know yoga. It's called gymnastics. It's called acrobatics. It's called circus arts. It's called martial arts. It's called track and field. It's called 20-somethings <laughs> jump about, run about, and look what I can do. And I can go faster and higher and longer and further and stretch and more. And I can touch my toes. And oh, I'm so young, I can still touch my toes. You know, it's like uh, that's an age factor. It has nothing to do with philosophy. Okay, nothing, nothing to do with philosophy. You want to know what yoga is really about? You go to a place where there are old yogis, 80 year old yogis. There are places in Thailand, there are places in India, there are places in Laos, in Burma, where you can spend time with people who are 60, 70, 80, 90 years old who have been practicing Ayurveda and yoga all of their life. There are doctors who are still practicing in their 80s and in their 90s. And it's not uncommon. There's no like, oh, I retired, you know, I got the, I retired when I was 55 and got the big house and the golf, you know, country club and, you know, there's none of that. No, if you're a real doctor and you're really good, you don't retire. You die. You die. All good doctors don't ret right? Good doctors don't don't retire in the village. They just eventually die like everybody else. There's no reason to not practice medicine until the last day of your life. There's no reason. Okay? So, I would watch the old people and I'd watch them in the clinic and I'd watch them in the hospital and I'd watch them in the school and I would watch them practice on sick people. And we got sick people came to our clinic. I mean, oh my God. Anything you can imagine. Lot that you cannot imagine. And the eldest practitioners are the most senior. So the more serious the issue, the older the practitioner, generally speaking. The younger practitioners get the not quite so serious it's just how it is. And maybe if you're a young practitioner, you've only been practicing five years or eight years, maybe your job is to cook for the older practitioners. Maybe your job is just to get water. Maybe your job is just to keep things fluid and, and filled and moving. And maybe that's your job, you know? Uh, firewood is critical because there's no electricity. So if we needed something boiled or cooked like uh, to make a poultice, no, I prokop, someone, pry, herbal poultice or bolus, it's called in Ayurveda, uh, we had to uh, burn charcoal and make a fire to boil the water to steam the poultice to put on you. And so maybe that's your job as a, as a younger uh, practitioner, younger therapist, you have to uh, make fires all day. Make fires all day. You know, uh, I did that. I had to do that. All right. So I watched the old people practice. Now we learned these flows that had 19 and 20 and 50 and 100 moves, vinyasas that were very complex. They had Again, 50 moves, 100 moves, 150 moves that you do in a particular order and sequence, in a flowing sequence, and you go from posture to posture to posture to posture from A to Z. It's like reciting the freaking encyclopedia until one day it hit me, oh my God, I'm reciting the encyclopedia. These people have me reciting the encyclopedia. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. Because I went to Europe and in Switzerland they don't have a Z, they have a Z, okay? And in Britain they don't have a Z, they have a Z. Weird, I don't know what's up with those people. So, I realized that the vinyasa that I was taught was the catalog, was the encyclopedia. Because I would watch the old people practice and you know what? They never did it. They never did the flow. They never did the style. They never did the sequence that we learned in class. 
They never did what we learned on the mat. They never did it with sick people. They did some things from it. They did some things like it. They did some things with other things. And you know what sometimes they did? Nothing. They put the person on the mat or table. They sat with them at their side or feet, depending on north or south. In the south of Thailand, uh, preferred is by the abdomen or head. In the north of Thailand, it's always the feet. You always start with the feet. Because we're Western, eclectic, we can do both and often do. Some people even hold the hand. So, you know, there's all kinds of ways to start. And they would sit with the person, and in the south, they would just sit silently next to the person with their hand on their stomach for a period of time, which could be a minute, could be five minutes, could be half an hour. And then they would just why and say thank you and leave. So there was no posturing. There was no facilitation of postures. <laughs>